Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. This week, we're going to be talking about plastic gas can safety, and we'd like to thank Keith Danes for liking and sharing the podcast. And this week, we spoke to Garage Boss about gas cans. In 1815, Sir Humphrey Davy, a chemist, developed one of the first flame arresters to help prevent a coal miner's oil lamp from causing an explosion in mine shafts. Methane and other flammable gases in coal mines could be ignited by oil lamps causing a fire or an explosion. His lamp used a mesh screen as a flame arrester. It allowed oxygen to pass through for combustion, and it allowed light to pass through, but the holes in the mesh were too small to allow the flame to ignite anything past the screen. Hmm. Pretty cool, huh? Totally. The Portable Fuel Container Safety Act of 2020 set standards for portable fuel containers to help protect against the can exploding near an open flame or other ignition source. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission has been directed to require flame mitigation devices in portable fuel containers within the next two years. Hmm. The National Fire Protection Association estimates about 160,000 fires a year involve ignition of a flammable or combustible liquid, causing around 450 deaths and around 4,000 injuries. Hmm. They say flame mitigation devices will help prevent flashback, and this is when gas vapor coming out of the gas can gets ignited by a spark or a flame or a source of heat, and then it ignites the vapor inside the can, causing an explosion and fire. That's bad. A flame mitigation device is a mesh disc or a tube that's designed to allow gas and vapor to flow through it, but the shape and the size of the openings prevent a spark or a flame from entering the gas can and igniting the vapors. Hmm, that's interesting. The biggest risk of an explosion with a gas can is when there is only a small amount of liquid gas and a large amount of gas vapor. Hmm. A study done by Worcester Polytechnic Institute's Department of Fire Prevention found that putting a few teaspoons of gas in a gas can, mounting the can at an angle similar to pouring out gas, and then igniting the vapors coming out of the spout can cause the can to explode. From their tests, they found the highest risk of a flashback explosion is when there is a low volume of gasoline inside the can, the outside temperature is low, the gas has been in storage or it's old gas, which is interesting, and the can is being held at a 42 degree angle. For an explosion to happen, the vapor coming out of the can has to come in contact with an ignition source, like a spark or flame, Mm -hmm. and then inside the can, there has to be a large enough volume of vapor and air. They concluded that flame mitigation devices are necessary to help prevent an explosion. Hmm. I read an article from Just Right. They make safety gas cans, and Just Right is J-U-S-T-R-I-T-E. They said one gallon of vaporized gasoline can explode with the same force as 20 sticks of dynamite. Wow. Amazing, huh? Yes. I read an article from NBC News. They investigated gas can fires and explosions. Robert Jacoby poured gasoline onto a pile of leaves so he could burn them. And as he walked away from the pile with the gas can, the can ignited and exploded He suffered burns on 75% of his body. Oh, wow. His medical bills were over a million dollars, and investigators think a static charge from his genes are what ignited the gas vapor. Wow. William Melvin was refilling his riding lawnmower with a gas can. The can exploded, and he suffered extensive burns to his upper body. Hmm. Dylan Cornegay poured gas on a bonfire, and as he walked away, the can exploded and caused burns to 80% of his body. He had to have multiple surgeries, and he died due to an infection. Wow, terrible. 
A 13-year-old boy was standing next to a campfire when another teenager poured gas on the fire with a gas can. Hmm. The can exploded, and he suffered second- and third-degree burns over his arms, his torso, and his neck. Hmm. A former firefighter used a gas can to refill his chainsaw. The can exploded, causing burns. He had to have his arm amputated, and he was in a coma for four months. Ugh. Wow, terrible. The fire safety advisor for Midwest Can, they make fuel containers, is a professional firefighter. He says using gasoline to fuel cars, lawnmowers, motorcycles, and snowblowers is so much a part of our everyday life that we can forget how dangerous it can be if we don't handle or store gas cans properly. He says never use gasoline to start a fire. The vapors can ignite and flash back into the gas can. Mm-hmm. And you should always allow gas-powered equipment to cool off before you refill the gas tank. Heat from the engine or gas spilled on a muffler or other hot surfaces can ignite gas vapors, and under some conditions, it could cause the gas can to explode if it doesn't have a flame mitigation device. Okay. I read an article in Live Science on the summer and winter blends of gasoline, In the winter, companies produce gasoline with lighter hydrocarbons. It makes it more volatile and easier to ignite. So you have to be careful when you're refilling a snowblower. They suggest you allow it to cool off for a few minutes before you pour gasoline into the tank. Interesting. The Oregon State Fire Marshal says always wait until lawnmowers and other small engines are cool before you add gas. Mm Mm-hmm. Only fill a small engine in a well-ventilated space. They say in Oregon, more than 200 adults are severely burned each year when they use gasoline or ignitable liquids to burn trash or yard debris or to light campfires or charcoal grills. Hmm. You should never use gasoline to start a charcoal grill or a campfire. Right. You should only be using a fire starter or lighter fluid. That's what I'm saying. That's what... (laughs) I'm agreeing. (laughs) The American Petroleum Institute has some tips for safety when you're filling your gas can at a filling station. A filling station? Yes. Gas station? (laughs) So, turn off your vehicle's engine. Turn off sources of ignition if you have a camper or an RV. Don't smoke. Use matches or a lighter when you're filling a gas can. Don't use the lock on the nozzle when you're filling a gas can, and don't re-enter your vehicle when you're filling a gas can. Friction from your seat and your clothing can create static electricity. Hmm. You should always discharge any static buildup before reaching for the nozzle by touching something metal with your bare hands, like Mm -hmm. your car door. Right. Only use approved portable gas cans. Place the gas can on the ground to avoid static electricity igniting fuel vapors because it grounds the can by putting it on the ground. Gas containers should never be filled inside a vehicle or the trunk or the bed of a pickup or the floor of a trailer because it won't be grounded and you could ignite the vapors. The National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health says flowing gas can create static electricity. The gas dispenser nozzle then can create a spark and ignite gas vapors. Hmm. They recommend placing the gas can on the ground about five feet from your vehicle because gas vapors are heavier than air. A hot exhaust manifold or a catalytic converter can ignite the vapors. And they also say you should touch the metal on your vehicle to discharge any static electricity buildup on your body before you fill your gas can. Keep the gas nozzle in contact with the gas can and fill slowly for less static electricity. Only fill your can 95% full so there's room for expansion. If you're transporting gas cans, keep them in the trunk or a truck bed. Hmm. In cars, keep the trunk slightly open with a bungee cord, and that's going to reduce heat buildup and expansion in the can and prevent potential fumes from getting inside the car, especially with older cans. And then tie or wedge the can in place so it doesn't move. There have been safety updates for gas cans produced after 2009. The new EPA regulations are based on requirements started in California by the California Air Resources Board. 
CARB, C-A-R-B. <laughs> Portable fuel containers now require a single self-venting opening for filling and pouring. There's no separate vent or openings. With the older style gas cans, you would have a vent hole on the back. Usually had a little cap on it. And you would open that for better gas flow. And some people would open that just so the can wouldn't expand in summer. The body of gas cans now limit evaporation and permeation emissions to 0.3 grams a day. They have to have automatically closing seals to prevent gas spills and vapor loss through the spout and childproof locks on the spout to prevent opening the spout and removing it. Hmm. Many gas can manufacturers have added a flame mitigation device voluntarily ahead of the Portable Fuel Container Safety Act of 2020, and that makes their cans much safer. Homeowners aren't required to upgrade to the new gas cans, but they are much safer and better for the environment. Hmm. Some towns have gas can exchange events where residents can exchange their old gas cans for a new EPA carb-compliant can. And you should call your town to see if they have a program like that. Cool. The legacy of Christopher Alsup Foundation, and Alsup is A-L-L-S-U-P, is a public charity that's raising awareness about the dangers of outdated gas cans and how a gas can with a flame arrester can help prevent a gas can from causing an explosion. Christopher was 10 years old when a gas can exploded, he suffered burns to over 90% of his body, and he died from the injuries. Oh, terrible. His foundation is educating people about the dangers of gas cans, and they created a gas can exchange program. Oh, that's nice. An article from Safe Kids Greater Des Moines recommend only using gas cans that meet industry standards and have a flame arrester. Never store gas in soda bottles or any container other than a gas can. It can be confused as a beverage for kids and cause poisonings. Hmm. Keep a gas can out of the reach of children and store it in a well-ventilated area outside your vehicle or living space. Keep gas cans away from any type of heat source. Gas cans stored by an appliance like a clothes dryer or a water heater could ignite the gas vapors. And talk to your children about gasoline safety and the dangers. The American Academy of Pediatricians estimates that over 40,000 emergency room visits by children every year are a result of gas-related injuries. Hmm. If you're storing multiple types of fuel in a detached garage or a shed, red cans are for gasoline, yellow cans are for diesel, blue cans are for kerosene. You want them organized in the correct containers so you don't accidentally use the wrong fuel and damage an engine or cause a fire or an explosion. Right. ExxonMobil has some guidelines for safe gas can storage. Gasoline must be stored in an approved fuel can and leave some room in the can for expansion. Mm -hmm. Keep gas cans tightly sealed. The new cans have self-sealing spouts but you still have to tighten the spout to the gas can securely. Store gas cans at room temperature away from heat sources like a water heater and keep them out of direct sunlight. Only store gas cans in a detached garage or a shed at least 50 feet from ignition sources. Gasoline vapors are heavier than air and they can travel along the floor to an ignition source. Wow. State Farm Insurance recommends only storing gas cans in a shed or a detached garage, not in an attached garage. If you do store gas cans in an attached garage, a ventilation system will make it safer. And we've talked about systems like the Easy Breathe Garage Ventilation System and how it can not only improve the air quality in your garage, but in your home. Right. And we talked about that in our garage safety episode. And Easy Breathe is just the letter E the letter Z, capital B-R-E-A-T-H-E. And if you have an attached garage, adding a shed will give you a safe place to store gas cans and your lawn equipment. It'll free up space in your garage and it will improve the air quality in your home. Hmm. With the new gas can designs since 2009, the gas can is pretty airtight, which is better for your gas. 
gas starts to degrade when it's exposed to oxygen, so upgrading to a new EPA carb-compliant gas can will help keep your gas fresh. Mm -hmm. And then if you add a fuel stabilizer like Stable or AMS oil, every time you fill up your gas can, it'll help keep the fuel fresh in your can and the small engine that you're putting it into, and it helps keep the gas fresh during the off-season. Right. Stable is S-T-A-B-I-L, and AMS oil is A-M-S-O-I-L. If you purchase a new EPA carb compliant plastic gas can, you're going to Oh, that was a mouthful. <laughs> you're going to notice that it will expand and contract with temperature changes a lot more than the old cans because they're so airtight. Mm. And this is normal. The cans are designed to tolerate the changes in pressure for the EPA regulations so they're not venting more than 0.3 grams a day. If you keep your can 95% full, it's going to reduce the amount of swelling and shrinking. And less vapor in the can is safer. Right. And keep your can out of direct sunlight. Mm -hmm. Some top rated plastic gas cans come from Garage Boss. It's G A R A G E, capital B O S S. Sure Can, S U R E, capital C A N. No Spill, N O S P I L L. Midwest, M I D. W-E-S-T, and Scepter, S-C-E-P-T-E-R. And we spoke to Garage Boss about their gas cans. Pavel, how you doing? Hi, JC, how are you? Real good, thank you. Cindy and I were talking about gas can safety, and we were hoping you could give us some information on your gas cans. Absolutely. The safety standards are actually... Uh, common for the gas can industry or portable fuel container industry, and they include the following three features. Devices to minimize vapor emissions and spills, which is usually contained in the uh, spout of the gas can, which is, you know, why some people believe that they're kind of hard to use, but it actually makes the product a lot safer and minimizes the amount of uh, emissions. Uh, another feature why the gas can spouts are a little bit, you know, some people complain about them, but in the past, accidents with children have occurred uh, up to drinking gasoline and up to, obviously, of playing with fire and all those kinds of things. So as a society, we don't want that for the same reason that we don't let children play with matches or lighters or lighter fluid or all those kinds of things. Sure. And the last safety feature in uh, gas cans, and this is the more of the newest one, part of the reason why the industry self-adopted a year ago and it became law uh, actually about a month and a half ago, something called a flame mitigation device, which is the equivalent of a metal cap with perforations on an overproof bottle of liquor that you'd see at a bar. So gasoline has a very low flash point. It was designed to start uh, an engine in low temperature with just a spark plug. Its flash point is negative 45 degrees. To compare that with paint th thinner or barbecue starter, the temperature for those is about 40 Celsius. So you're talking about an 80 degree difference. In the past, many incidents have occurred where teenagers and regretfully adults have sometimes uh, poured gasoline onto a burn barrel. Even at low temperature, it could be very dangerous, and it is extremely dangerous. Our position is that it's never safe to use a gasoline container to start to accelerate a fire. Vapor of gasoline is something that you cannot actually see in normal conditions, and the purpose of the flame mitigation device is that if such vapor becomes comes into contact with a source of ignition, it can no longer enter the can back and cause an explosion. When flame ingresses the gasoline, particularly weathered gasoline or gasoline that sat around for some period of time, a phenomenon called jetting can occur, where your gasoline container could essentially become a flamethrower. Suppose a teenager or sometimes even not a teenager is pouring gasoline onto a fire with the prophetic phrase, watch this, and somebody is standing as far away as 10 or 15 feet away on the other side of the fire. The gasoline vapor can become ignited and could cause the gasoline to 
enter the gas can and to egress out, becoming a sort of flamethrower. So you could not only hurt yourself, but you could hurt others. So the purpose of this device is to prevent such accident or to minimize the effect of uh, the, the likelihood of such accidents. In, uh, in the United States, the number one source of gas station explosions happens to be nylon clothing. You must touch either your car or the gas pump, particularly on a cold day, because suppose you're a lady that's wearing uh, nylon stockings. You, you could actually produce a spark that could cause the entire gasoline station to go uh, up in the air. Amazing. So it's a, it's a very serious issue, and uh, we, our company as well as others, have moved aggressively to minimize the likelihood of this happening. And with your gas cans, you have a very unique way to dispense the gas out of your can? Ours is unique in that we, we were the first to introduce a device which is called Press and Pour under the brand name Garage Boss, where you can essentially use the dispensing device, the dispensing portion of the gasoline container with one hand. Uh, that works for one and two gallon cans, but when you're looking at a five gallon can, it's still you're still talking about 40 pounds when it's full. Ours is the first ergonomic design that provides both child safety, senior friendliness, and is intuitive and ergonomic to use. Our design is essentially something you look at and you you, you know how to use it. Uh, you don't have to read a booklet of oh you twist this, you depress this, and and, you know, you can pick it up and it, it, you look at it and you know how to use it. Pavel, what are some of the different uses homeowners should be thinking about with a gas can? Uh, there are the classic lawn and garden type applications. There is also sports applications because if you're off-roading or what's, you know, now that I'm in Kentucky, there is a sport called mudding with uh, four-wheelers. There are no gas stations. There are no charging stations. So... You know, it's important for you to, to have fuel on you. This is also true of motorcycles. That they're, they're bikers that travel across the country, and sometimes there are stretches where there's no gas station for a significant period of time. And, you know, a one-gallon can of gasoline is the difference between, you know, sitting by the side of the road and, you know, actually making it to your destination. So there, these are the kind of the three major categories that occur in the ordinary course. And, but however, there is also a very significant portion of the, of demand in uh, natural disasters. As many of your listeners uh, may know, about 77 counties in Texas, in the state of Texas, lost power. Uh, one of the things that people need is they need a, they need a generator to power their electric uh, devices to, you know, to provide for basic uh, necessities. For those of us that remember Hurricane Hugo, people were without power for a month, and uh, their you know their only solution was to have a to have a generator and uh, purchase gasoline in advance. So that's that that remains a very important feature of having you know at least one gasoline container to to give yourself a peace of mind in case something like that happens. Sure. You have a five-gallon military-style gas can that has three handles. That looks pretty interesting. Yes, yes. those are actually called uh, jerry cans. Those are made out of metal. It's, it's a smaller portion of the market, particularly people that uh, they like Jeeps or they like kind of the classic look. But, uh, they're very durable. They're very good. You also have a gas-oil combo can. What is that That's for? That's correct. That's correct. Uh, we we, manu we were the sole manufacturer in the United States of the what's, what's called a combo can. These are used uh, typically by forestry and uh, uh, firefighter professionals who are using a chainsaw or another type of uh, uh, power equipment with some kind of a rotating or uh, abrasive device. So one portion of the gas of the combo can is for for bar chain oil, and the other compartment, the larger compartment is reserved for gasoline. So you can keep on going the entire day. We're the only manufacturer of these, and we also make them out of metal. Garage Boss also makes oil drain pans? Yes, uh, we do. So people that change oil, particularly people that live in a rural environment, always face the challenge. Okay, well, I can drain this oil, but what do I do with it afterwards? 
So typically places like AutoZone or Advanced Auto have oil recycling days. And our drain pans are designed to kind of capture the oil after you've drained it. So it's not, so you're not carrying it in some kind of like a aluminum container and then trying to figure out how to decant it someplace. So you can, they're designed to be kind of a one-stop solution. Okay, you've drained it, you wipe the, uh, the funnel that, that comes with it, screw it closed. Next time you, you, you happen to be at uh, one of the auto uh, retailers or, or another place where you can recycle oil, you can, you can uh, recycle it there. One of our patented products that we sell quite a bit of is called the Reacher by Garage Boss. The reason we designed that over the years, particularly over the 1990s, what happened was the fleet of American automobiles moved from cars towards more SUVs and trucks and the, uh, the, the height of the vehicle has increased. So people that are changing their own oil on a much taller vehicle, and I, for example, I, I own a truck right now, so for, I don't even have to put it on a jack in order to change oil. But the problem is this. It comes out very fast once you, once you unscrew the, the plug. Uh, it's coming down uh, sometimes a foot, foot and a half, if not more. You don't want it to kind of hit your either your garage floor or you. So the Reacher is a design that was specifically a response to American vehicles becoming taller. And what it does is it prevents oil from essentially splashing once it hits some kind of a, a hard surface. And so the Reacher is a, a series of uh, extensions that go up to a funnel which make capturing your oil much closer to where your valve is. So it doesn't fall down uh, upwards of a foot and a half and splash either all over you or all over your garage floor. You don't make a mess. So that's, that, that's, a, that's a unique feature to Garage Boss um, family of products. Pavel, if we wanted to learn more about your products, where would we go? Our company is uh, actually called TPG Plastics. Uh, that's the parent company of Garage Boss. Okay. But um, you can go to tpgplastics.com or you can go to gogaragebossa.com. G O G A R A G E boss.com. And uh, one of the first things you'll see is a series of videos of some of the products that we uh, discussed, including the drain pans and our new ergonomic spout that we actually launched just in in the third quarter of 2018. And you also see how we make uh, funnels for automotive uh, aftermarket work. All right, Pavel. Well, I appreciate your time. Well, thank you, JC. That was a great interview. Yeah, we appreciate Garage Boss giving us some tips and information for this episode. Do you have anything else to add? For safety... Replace your old plastic gas cans with an EPA carb-compliant can with a fuel mitigation device built in. Only fill your can 95% full to allow for expansion. It'll also reduce expansion and contraction of plastic cans. Mm -hmm. Always add a fuel stabilizer to keep your fuel fresh longer. Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our eBooks, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, Books 1 through 13 on Amazon. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow Cindy on Twitter at fixitcohost. And you can follow us on Instagram, Fix It Home Improvement. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week.